Isn't it an awesome privilege for us to worship together, to come into the presence of the Lord? Amen? I mean, the choir did an exceptional job. There is nothing like it. Guys, we are the living temple. We get to gather together and come around God's word. And I know half of you need to check your heart because you just came this morning to bug me about Appalachian State beating the Aggies, and that's why you showed up. But no... We are here to worship the Lord. Now, who, who did that? My goodness. All right, we're going to continue our walk through the book of Acts. Turn with me in your Bibles to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. Uh, we're going to be reading the first 13 verses of Acts chapter 2. Very important that you remember where we were. Okay, a couple weeks ago, where we last left our disciples. So after Jesus' resurrection, he appears to the disciples for 40 days, and then they get to watch him ascend, right? The Daniel 7 cloud rider, and see him enthroned into heaven. His final instructions are to wait in Jerusalem, and you will receive the promised Holy Spirit, power from on high, from God the Father, so that you can be witnesses. And they've been waiting, they've been reading their Bible, they've been praying together, taking great comfort, actually, in the fact that, that God's word had predicted Jesus, uh, Judas's betrayal, Right? hundreds of years prior, helping them to overcome the shock of it all. And now we come to Pentecost. Now, before reading the passage, I want to do us some help. It would help a lot if, if you and I could understand the Jewish calendar, the festivals that God had set up for 1,500 years, and, and how all of it was pointing to Jesus. Even those festivals pointing to Jesus. So think all the way back to Exodus. Remember the Exodus and the 10 plagues and the final plague, right? The death angel is coming. But Israel was told to take the blood of a lamb and to put it over the doorpost as a sign that they were God's chosen people. And the death angel would come and would see the blood and would pass over. And that very night, God was going to bring judgment upon Egypt, but he would show mercy to his people, Israel. Well, every year after that, God instructed, he instituted a festival, right? The Passover celebration as a reminder of God's saving act. And every year, every able male, usually accompanied by his entire family, was required to make the pilgrimage to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover as a nation together. And thousands would flood to Jerusalem to sacrifice and to eat a lamb. And it was during that Passover celebration when thousands had flooded to Jerusalem that Jesus, the Passover lamb of God, was sacrificed so that by his blood, our sins could be forgiven. You see, the New Testament wants you to know that Jesus is the fulfillment of the Passover, right? Says it specifically, 1 Corinthians 5, 7. And Jesus and his disciples were eating the Passover meal as Daniel walked us through last week when Jesus stands up and says, this is my body, this cup is my blood. Now there's another festival requirement that you may not be aware of. It is called the offering of the first fruits. And it is always the first day after the Sabbath Passover. Okay, the Sabbath, or sorry, the, the, the Passover institutes a Sabbath, the first day after the Sabbath Passover. You see, because Israel was an agricultural society, 
And the Passover is at the beginning of spring. The first Sabbath, the first day after the Passover Sabbath, one was required to bring one sheaf of grain. All right, that's one stalks of grain, one sheaf of grain to the temple as an offering of the very first fruits of the season. Okay? One was not allowed to eat any of the, the new uh, grain or, or harvest until this dedication. Okay? You were not allowed to eat new crops yet. The year of Jesus' death, following the Passover, the offering of the first fruits fell on Resurrection Sunday. We call it Easter. Because as 1 Corinthians 15 and Acts 26 tells us, Jesus is the first fruits from the dead. You see, for 1,500 years, God had planned for his people bring one sheep to the temple as a dedication of first fruits. And it's Resurrection Sunday. That Passover kicked off seven weeks, 49 days where Israel was only allowed to eat unleavened bread. To remember their time in the wilderness when they left Egypt in haste. Okay? That 49 days was a mild time of mourning, right? There were no weddings, no parties that you were allowed to attend. But after the completion of those 49 days, on the 50th day, there was a huge celebration. Pentecost. Okay? Another festival... Right where you were required to make the pilgrimage to Jerusalem, but this time to celebrate the harvest. Because God had provided abundantly in the promised land. And they were to come from wherever they lived, okay? And they were to bring a huge food and drink offering to the Lord out of thankfulness for God's abundant harvest. Okay, that background will help us set our minds right now as we read and understand what's going on in Acts 2 with the celebration of Pentecost. So listen as I read the first 13 verses of Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a noise, like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were staying. And there appeared to them tongues as of fire, distributing themselves. And they, and they rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit of God was giving them utterance. Now there were Jews staying in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the crowd came together and were bewildered because each one of them was hearing them speak in his own language. They were amazed and astonished, saying, why are... Are not all these speaking Galileans? And how is it that, each, that, that we each hear them in our own language to which we were born? You see, Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia and Judea and Cappadocia and Pontius and Asia and uh, Phygria and Pamphylia and Egypt and districts of Libya around Kyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes and Cretans and Arabs, we hear them in our own tongues speaking of the mighty deeds of God. And they, and they all continued in amazement, in great perplexity, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others were mocking and saying they are full of sweet wine. Will you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, 
As we come to your word this morning, Father, we pray that you would not only teach us, but that you would show us your mighty hand woven all through history, accomplishing your will for your great name. Father, as your people, we are gathered together around your word longing for you to open our eyes to allow us to see your magnificence and your glory and to see the way that that changes our lives and our heart. We pray all of this in Jesus' name, amen. You see, the disciples are following Jesus' final instructions, right? Go back to Jerusalem and wait We are given no indication that they know how long they are supposed to wait. They don't know how long it's going to take. They are gathered in one place, about 120 of them near the temple. Luke doesn't tell us the exact location. But as Chuck Swindoll suggests, perhaps they have decided to celebrate the the, the Pentecost together in the courtyard of a private home near the center of town. They have planned the day together. They're going to go to the temple and give their offering and then come back and worship together. It's 9 a.m., the time of the morning that the, the morning offering is given at the temple, when suddenly... A sound so violent that it shook the walls and could be heard for miles around. Like when an F-16 does a flyover at a football game. Luke tells us a noise came from heaven like violent rushing wind. There seemed to be no effects from the wind, just deafening roar, clearly coming from the house that the disciples are all gathered and staying at. An amazing sight accompanies the noise. They look up and see fire. You know, God had routinely showed himself in fire, right? In the burning bush, in the pillar of fire that would lead Israel out of Egypt. We will come back to this idea of fire even more next week. But they look up and they see fire, probably in one ball, right there in the middle of the room. Luke also describes it as tongues. And then each portion of fire seems to separate throughout the room and land on each individually, resting on each one of them, and they are all filled with the Holy Spirit. Pause for a second and think of the peace, the excitement, the ecstasy of experiencing God in this way, right? In our, in our minds, we go back to like in Second Chronicles when the Shekinah glory of the Lord fills the temple, but now it's occurring in individuals. They could not help but begin to shout praises to God and begin to tell of all the incredible things that God has done. Jesus, you died in our place. You resurrected from the dead. 
You ascended to the right hand of God the Father. You are on your throne. And now, as you have promised, the Father has sent the Holy Spirit and indwells us so that we can know you. So that we can know you. They begin to shout praises. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. And as they are gathered, we can assume that they have moved out into the courtyard. Okay, in, in ancient times, they would have homes, but, but a good-sized home would have a, a very large courtyard. That they've moved out into the courtyard. The reason is because a large crowd has gathered around them. Men and women from miles around have heard the violent wind sound and come to check it out. You see, at once, the disciples have become witnesses to thousands. And the disciples are shouting praises to God. And something even more miraculous happens. You see, the the tongues that fall, the fire that falls, it is not simply an ecstatic experience for the disciples. Rather, these there is a miracle, a magnificent display of God's power that is now for thousands to experience. Because the Spirit gave them utterance to begin to speak foreign languages. As diverse as the crowd was, Luke lists 15 different people groups, different languages that have gathered together. All of these different languages are now spoken and heard, praising God, telling of the wonderful, mighty deeds of what God is doing. Clearly a sign that the Holy Spirit has fallen because the disciples don't speak these languages. In fact, the the crowd will say, hey, aren't these Galileans? That may not mean a lot to you and I, but, but Galileans were considered uneducated, kind of country folk. Hick, they spoke with an accent. They are looked down upon. Okay? Are these Galileans speaking all of these languages? Now, to truly see what God is doing, we need to pause and I need to retell the story from the perspective of the visitors that day. Because Luke tells us that devout Jews had come from all over the Roman Empire, even outside of the Roman Empire. These Jews who were or Israelites who were born elsewhere, it says Medes and Mesopotamians and Arabs and Egyptians, born in foreign lands, taught various languages from birth. They would gather together there in Jerusalem, but you must understand they are separated by distance and language and culture. They devoutly made their way back to Jerusalem, back to the temple to celebrate as God had commanded, come and bring your your harvest. But if we're honest, this isn't the way that it was supposed to be. These Israelites had lost their inherited land due to the sins of their forefathers. You see, Pentecost was supposed to celebrate the goodness of the promised land and to come and to bring the harvest because God had had brought the rains in their season, had given them such a fertile land. Pentecost was supposed to, it it was supposed to be a lot easier than what was actually taking place. You see, the people had been scattered no longer in the land. As God had repeatedly warned Israel, 
You can look at like Leviticus 26, the blessings and the curses, okay? I will bless you abundantly if you seek after me, if you look towards me. But, but if you turn and you, you worship other gods, then, then I, will, I will not give you your rains in their season. And, and if that doesn't turn you back to me, then I will allow your enemy to come and to rule over you. And if that doesn't cause you to turn back to me, I, I will allow famine in the land. And if that doesn't cause you to turn back to me in and, and this entire progression, and, and then the final one is, if, if that doesn't cause, I will scatter you. Among the nations. And that's Israel's history. As it had been for the last 500 years. They had been exiled to Babylon. Scattered amongst the nations. And yes, a remnant had come back to Jerusalem, but if we're honest, it was very, very few had returned. See, the last 500 years had been incredibly harsh towards the people of God. And you see, they return for Pentecost and they bring their offering. They make the very long journey but they long for God's mercy. They have an aching. They, they wish things could simply go back to the way they were. They dream about freedom and land and unity. A nation. But God has something so much greater in store. Because just as he had promised Isaiah and Hosea and Jeremiah... After I scatter you, I will remember you. And I will gather you again to myself. I have not forgotten you. I love you. I long to redeem you the way that I brought you out of the land of Egypt. And so here they are in Jerusalem. With all the events surrounding the Passover and Jesus' death. The disciples with the proclamation that he has risen from the dead. They've made the long, difficult journey from all over the empire. Let's say they're Parthian. That is from Iran or Pakistan, way over there by India. And your family, right? Right? You, you found a place to stay. You've been pilgrimage. You, you, you made the long journey. You found a place to stay. You are there to honor God with your harvest offerings. And suddenly, you hear a sound that grabs your attention. It forces you to, what was that? It forces them to go and to, to see, to find out what it is. And, and as you arrive, as you draw near, you begin to hear eloquent, compelling praises of God. But in your heart language. And standing next to you is an Egyptian. And he says... I hear it too, but I can hear it in my birth language. And you notice all around, for the, there's all these different people in all these different languages, and they're all claiming this. I hear it too, but in, in my birth language. And you begin to ask the question, what is happening? And then Peter stands up and addresses the crowd. And he tells them, listen, the Spirit of God has fallen just the way that he promised in Joel chapter 2. Don't you see it? The Spirit of God has fallen. 
And then he pivots and begins to uh, proclaim to them the good news of Jesus Christ. All the events that had unfolded over the last 50 days. That Jesus was the Son of God and that he had come to forgive their sins. That he's the Passover lamb. That he had come to forgive their sins. That all of this was according to God's plan. God's plan, Jesus' death and resurrection, that God planned it in order to forgive their sins. And Luke tells us they were pierced to the heart and said, what must we do? Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the Holy Spirit. And three things, thousand were saved right there that day from all over the Roman Empire those who were once scattered had now been gathered in an incredible outpouring of God on Pentecost the celebration of the harvest had begun do you see it and it would continue As the disciples have now become fishers of men. Just like Jeremiah 16 promised. You see, in one miraculous act, God had united what culture, distance, and language had divided Think with me back to Genesis chapter 11 in the story we know as the Tower of Babel. God had given instructions to man to fill the earth and subdue it. But in Babel, which will become to be known as Babylon, They decide that they are not going to obey. They are not going to spread out, but rather they are going to form together. They are going to mass their power together, okay, in order to enslave all the labor that they will need to build a giant tower. And in God's judgment... And for our own good, he confuses the languages, causing the people to separate and to spread out according to their languages. But pause and consider where this leaves us. Because man still wars to enslave one another. And the dividing walls over culture and language leave us tribal and isolated misunderstood, untrusting, and separated. But when the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, falls at Pentecost, it's the undoing of Babel. Suddenly, languages communicate to praise God And they become one in Christ Jesus. The undoing of Babel. An ingathering of Parthians and Medes and Cretans and Arabs. It's a picture of a new spiritual people. That we call the church. I had an idea this week and I asked our Some of our mission partners that we have, you know, at this church, we have an awesome honor and privilege. We have 12 international mission partners spread throughout the globe. Watch this quick video. Gloria a Dios en las alturas. Slava Vishnik Bogu. Gloria a Dios en las alturas. Now, how cool is that? How beautiful is that? The different languages, all praising the one true God underneath the name 
with Jesus Christ. When standing in a remote part of Uganda this summer, preaching through a translator, remember I told you guys that, that I tried to use an illustration of McDonald's. And I asked them to raise it. Have any of you heard of McDonald's? And no one raised it. They had no clue who McDonald's was. And I thought, this is not going to go over very well. <laughs> but then to be able to reset and to just talk about the truths of Jesus Christ and to hear them get charged and just praise God because of the promises that are found in Jesus Christ? Do you know how unifying that is to be on the other side of the world and to know that these are my brothers and sisters? We are one. There is a trust. There is a love that is found in Christ Jesus. I mean, it's one of the most amazing aspects of our church Right, that we go to the ends of the earth and we partner with believers in so many different cultures and languages because the Holy Spirit has promised power to be his witnesses. Church, I, I truly hope you get that part of our mission, that you see it, that we go together, that we give our resources together so that we are fulfilling the Great Commission together. Amen. All right, so where does that leave us this morning? Two quick points and then I'm done. One, I, I wanted you to see again the ability for the gospel to unify that which the world divides. See, because all of these believers will leave Pentecost and Jerusalem first and foremost as followers of Jesus. They may have come as Egyptians and Libyans, but they will leave first Christians. Beloved, that is your primary identity as well. Not as a Republican or Democrat or white or English speaking or an Aggie who lost to Appalachian State or an engineer or a member of First Baptist. First and foremost, you are a follower of Jesus Christ. And it means that the dividing walls have been torn down. And one of the evidences that God is near, that God is moving, is that he unites that which the world divides. So I want you to pause and I want you to think about our culture and what are our strongest divisions? What are the strongholds that divide us in our nation right now? Because man naturally groups based on education, political affiliation, and ethnicity, and affluence, and age groups. And we've talked often in here about the way that the church even divides, mainly over music preference, dividing our generations. So let me ask you this. Do you have any relationships in your life where a friend would ask, why are you friends with them? And the only answer is Jesus. Right? Is it, is it even an older saint who's discipling you or someone younger that you're pouring into? Because if our churches don't look any different than country clubs, then the world can easily explain our God. You see, those, at Pen those who left Pentecost, they had some explaining to do. Why are you friends with him? Jesus. Because of Jesus. Because he overcomes dividing walls. Secondly, I've been praying about this all week, and 
this, this text, I mean, I want you to see the delight of God as he gathers his people, as he unfolds his plan. I just want you to think about the delight of God as he's doing it, right? As he's undoing Babel, as he's doing the opposite of, of what happens, do you remember when Israel received the covenant on Mount Sinai and, and Moses is up on the mountain and, and, and they build a golden calf and Moses has to come down and pull out the sword and kill 3,000 that one day? Do you, do you think it's coincidence that when the Spirit falls at Pentecost and Peter stands up and preaches that 3,000 are saved that day? God's undoing, God's plan unfolding as he undoes Babel, as Jesus is the Passover lamb, as Jesus is the firstborn from the dead, and now at the harvest of Pentecost, in, in the poetic part of God's magnificent plan unfolding as he's the fulfillment of festival after festival, how God had written these festivals 1,500 years before it actually occurs, before the fulfillment occurs, and all the while. And then the gospel explodes in Jerusalem and will go all throughout the Roman Empire. Can't you just see the delight of God as his plans are unfolding. His plan, his timing, but all throughout history, there have been major movements of God that we call revival. In the darkness, Burst forth the light of the gospel, where the Holy Spirit chooses to move in power and to bring large numbers to faith. The great awakening, the second great awakening, the Welsh revival, the revival that's happening now in Africa, in Iran, in China. Even in the most persecuted parts of the world, the gospel going forward. Many of you in this church, many decades ago, experienced a revival at Castle Hills in San Antonio. Can I tell you that in college, God moved incredibly and powerfully in my life? I would even tell you in supernatural ways, he grabbed a hold of my life. It was, it was later that I was in seminary and I heard in my missions class, a seminary professor stand up and talk about a pocket revival that had happened at a and during the period of time that I was there. Did you know that the, the Lord's Prayer teaches us to pray for revival? Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Right? We, we don't pray for the, the judgment of the Lord to come against our nation. It may. God's plan, God's timing. But our prayer, our delight, our passion, your kingdom come. Your will be done. His plan, his timing, but I cannot help but read this passage and be stirred up by the delight of God for him to move in his timing, but to orchestrate and as it comes together for him to just be beaming with delight as he gathers those who were scattered, those who were completely unworthy. They were sinful. They should have been scattered. But God promised them and said, I will remember you and I will gather you to myself. And as he does so, for just the heartbeat of the Lord to be poured over. And I can't help but wonder Do I desire God to gather my fellow 
Bernieites and Texans and Americans. Do I desire that enough to genuinely beg God to do it? I mean, beg for a movement of the Lord. It's his plans and his timing. And whether he chooses to do it in a magnificent movement or whether he chooses because he will be faithful, whether he chooses to do it one at a time, I cannot control that. But when you understand that this is his delight, it changes the perspective. And it makes you want to cry out for his heartbeat. Will you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, this morning, as, as, as we have heard your word and the way that you have moved through history, the fact that you have planned it all, and it is magnificent, and in its poetry, it points to your magnificence that you are the sovereign king, but that you delight to gather together all the undeserving, who are willing to kneel at the foot of the cross. Heavenly Father, if there is anyone here this day that does not know you, may you open their eyes in an incredible way. May they see the good news of Jesus, that they can find salvation, that today is the day of salvation, to know you and to be filled with your Holy Spirit. And as your people, would you give us a passion, a desperate need for power that comes on high in order to reach the lost? In order to reach the lost, our neighbors, our coworkers, our family members, that all may come and have eternal life. We cry out right now, Father, because we need your power. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.